almost don't need to introduce these guys. <laughs> Jonathan, please go ahead. Um, but they told me to do this. It's part of my moderation duties. Welcome to the Star Trek science uh, session. Um, more broadly, we're going to be talking about what's right, what's wrong, and visionary from the Trek universe. And we have people who know, you know, the inside scoop of all this stuff right here on this panel. I was going to say, where are they? Yeah. <laughs> get those guys <laughs> over here. <laughs> Um, immediately to my right is Andre Bormanis. He's a writer producer for Star Trek Enterprise and science advisor for Star Trek Voyager, Deep Space Nine, and the Next Generation films, and has also written stories and teleplays for Enterprise and Voyager. Uh, right next to him. Uh, I think that's the thing you're supposed to do. Right? Someone who has had to say the lines that Andre wrote, uh, John Billingsley, an actor, you probably all know him as Dr. Phlox on Star Trek Enterprise. And uh, for those of you who are vampire fans, uh, he's currently starring as Mike Spencer on True Blood. Starring is not a really apt <laughs> <laughs> takes place on that series. Oh, yeah. Whoa. <laughs> I signed a nudity waiver. It's on my wall. <laughs> uh, he also has played Professor West in the 2012 film. And I think, did you talk about that yesterday or is that today? I think we're talking about it today. Uh, later today, he'll be on a panel talking about I it. I haven't seen it, actually, so it'll be <laughs> an interesting conversation. <laughs> and last but far from least, uh, Tim Russ, uh, actor best known as Tuvok on Star Trek Voyager. Um, also appearing on iCarly, and as those of you know, yesterday he's a kick-ass blues singer yeah. and an avid astronomer, uh, amateur astronomer. Apparently, several of you were at his session yesterday. So um, <laughs> we could ask him to like set up a blues riff, and he can sing his response. <laughs> 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 general question, uh, since this is about good, bad, and visionary science in Star Trek, I'll just, uh, we'll just go right down the line and each of you can share uh, your example of your favorite moment from one of the Star Trek um, films or TV. Ah, all right. I think I can. Oh, you can share. Yeah, I guess so. Um, you know, I think that um, one of the things that made Star Trek such an enduring show and, and, and universe is the fact that uh, Gene Roddenberry was very <coughs> insistent when he created the original series that it be grounded in some kind of scientific reality. Obviously, it took place hundreds of years in the future, but he wanted to make the show as credible as possible for an adult audience. So much of science fiction prior to Star Trek, at least on television, had been aimed at children, you know, Captain Video and Flash Gordon and all that sort of stuff. He wanted to do a show that was for adults, that um, you know, that dealt with issues that were not easy to talk about on television in the 1960s, but he could talk about them because he would sort of clothe it in these science fictional sorts of uh, metaphors. And, um, you know, he spent a lot of time with scientists and engineers from JPL, from other research um, entities uh, in, in Los Angeles in those days, to really think through before, you know, before he wrote the script, before they shot a frame of film, what one would need to survive in uh, interstellar space um, on a starship that uh, would have a crew of several hundred. It was modeled after you know, naval vessels of that day. And he really applied um, not, not just you know, the input from these various scientists who told him about what might be coming down the road 10, 20, 30 years or farther into the future, but just logical questions. Um, one, of the, one of my favorite anecdotes from from Roddenberry was that, uh, you know, when he was thinking about the Starship Enterprise, he knew that it had to have a bridge and it was going to have to have, uh, you know, mess halls and this and that and the other. And a sick bay had to have a place where crewmen who were injured or contract some weird alien virus get treated by the doctor. So he thought about, you know, what would a sick bay on a starship, you know, decades or hundreds of years into the future look like? He said, well, you know, think about today. It's like, man, you gotta go to the hospital and they stick a thermometer in your throat or someplace else. There you go. And, um, heat it up for you. Um, you know, if they want your blood pressure, they have to put a cuff on your arm, you know, all, you know, they cut you open and sew you back up. It's all very primitive. And he thought, you know, we've got computers, we've got radar. I would imagine that in the future, all of that stuff, it's so inefficient. Maybe you could just lay down on like a, a bed and there are sensors in the 
the bed that would read all of your vital signs and put them up on a computer screen for the doctor to look at instantaneously. And, you know, could have this and this and this. And it's just the kind of thinking out loud sort of stuff that he did, trying to be logical. And a few weeks after the show premiered in 1966, he started getting letters from GE and Siemens and these manufacturers of medical equipment saying, how did you know we were working on this? <laughs> and, well, he didn't. He didn't have any idea. He just asked himself some logical questions. And uh, the, the, the setting of Star Trek has always been the Milky Way galaxy, and Roddenberry was very clear about, you know, the ship can travel at warp, meaning it can go X many times the speed of light, and that means that if you're traveling five light years at this warp factor, it's going to take so and so many, you know, many days or weeks to travel that distance. Uh, obviously, he was very clear on stars, planets, planetary systems. Um, one of, the, one of the early episodes, which I, th I think was kind of um, extraordinary in retrospect, um, they traveled, uh, they, they, they had a, a run-in with what was called the Black Star, and were catapulted uh, 300 years into the past. And this was something that, you know, was maybe being talked about a little bit. I don't know if the term, I guess the term black hole had been coined maybe by then, but it wasn't in common use. Black Star was term that was used for what we now call black holes. And what I don't think was appreciated at the time, and which, you know, maybe was just a lucky accident, was um, that, yeah, there are trajectories that one could conceivably take around a spinning black hole that would tr allow you to travel backward in time. Mm. And, you know, it's like, wow, uh, who did they talk to about that? <laughs> uh, somebody who, uh, you know, who was obviously pretty sharp. So those, you know, those kinds of considerations were always at the forefront of Roddenberry's mind, and we tried to continue that tradition, certainly in, in the subsequent series. The fact that they had a guy like me and other people before me as their science consultant gives you some indication of the importance that they attached to making it credible. Now, obviously, we're hundreds of years in the future, and we, we have things that are not based in today's science and technology, like warp drives and transporters and so forth. But the idea was always to make that stuff consistent and logical and to base it as much as possible on principles that we understand today and extrapolate that stuff into the future in a way that, you know, is, is, is as reasonable as we can make it to serve the needs of the story. So that's kind of what I would say in a nutshell about uh, at least how we approached it and tried to, tried to make it work. Was that a favorite moment? That was a favorite moment. <laughs> just totally ignored the, the question. Black star, the black star. <laughs> totally ignored the question. <laughs> Let's hear from the union. Yes, what's your favorite? This will be a non-scientific interregnum between two scientific <laughs> speakers. Um, uh, I'll return to the question of what's right, wrong, and visionary from the track universe in a bit. Um, I, I, I think that for my money, my favorite moment, uh, I could only draw upon the four seasons I spent on Enterprise. There was an episode we did in which, uh, for those of you who watched the show, and there only may be three of you here, I don't know. Uh, one, two, three, four. Oh, all right. I guess given the nature of the event, I suppose. Um, uh, there was an episode in which Trip was cloned. Uh, and that was one of my favorite episodes. And I think it, for me, sort of hit on those things that when Star Trek works, I don't think it always works, but when it works, this is why it works. It dealt with a, a meaningful contemporary issue that had a scientific foundation and a sociological context and it dealt with it in a way that involved everyone in the ensemble cast so that the storytelling popped. Uh, ultimately, I'm an actor, not a scientist, and when so Star Trek works, it works because the stories grip you. Sometimes the stories don't work because I think one of the things that's somewhat problematic, and I don't want people pelting me with anything, what I think is sometimes problematic about Star Trek is that by starting with the premise that we've gotten to the point where we all get along so damn well, we drain Star Trek of some of the possibility for conflict, which is what makes for good drama. So sometimes Star Trek, to my mind, had to rest its drama <coughs> in the exterior landscape, i.e. we've met another group of folks who are having problems. We have a, a technical problem. We have a scientific issue. And yet, for me as an actor, I think ultimately your most interesting stories are rooted in the conflict amongst those folks who are trying, as you say, to live in this little sardine can and get along without throwing elbows out. 
So for my money, sometimes Star Trek doesn't work because the very optimistic assumption that we've managed to transcend some of the things that eat at us and that eat away and corrode our society have been resolved. I thought, frankly, that Enterprise missed the boat a little bit because, to my mind, what might have made it even more interesting was how do we find a way to get at this question? How did we move from where we are today when we have so much ethnic and racial strife, where we have haves and have-nots, where we have wars breaking out every time you turn around, to the enterprise, to the Star Trek world, when we've managed to put all of this behind us? What was that process? How did the Muslims and the Christians manage to bury the hatchet? I would have liked to have seen Enterprise actually deal with that a little bit more, well, not just a little bit more, a lot more than it did. So for me, what's right and what's wrong and what's visionary, it's right to posit an optimistic future. We have to have that. We have to believe in the possibility of human advancement. Not perfection, because that's unattainable, but human advancement. But it, I think sometimes, for my money, it's wrong to, to not grapple with the question of how? How do we get from here to there? That's my two cents. Um, you know, I, there are my favorite episodes uh, or moments in the word Trek are, I have to go along with John, a lot of these, my favorites are based in the, I'm not saying the story element, the human element of, of, uh, of, of the stories that we did. I mean, there were, there were certain episodes we had that were just captivating based on, uh, based on our, our, I don't want to say interference, we always were running into somebody's culture and sort of turning things upside down uh, quite often. Um, and and it, there's something about uh, that that made the stories, to me, uh, compelling. It's just, just using these, these alien cultures to sort of, uh, give, you know, sort of make a metaphor of our own societies. Uh, there, was, um, there was an episode with the, the, where our character Chakotay was captured by uh, these humanoid, as it were, Folks on our planet, and he was—he uh, had amnesia. So these uh, these people who looked just like us uh, were indoctrinating him, indoctrinating him into their clan to be a rebel fighter against this horrible, you know, uh, foe that they had to deal with. These hideous, ugly, bestial critters that uh, they were dealing with on the planet, and they were conscripting him into fighting with them as a, as a rebel cause because they're so brutal and they're so evil. And so he was brainwashed into following them uh, and becoming one of them until we, have, of course, rescued him. And, and we discover at the end of the story that these, these hideous creatures, were, which look not unlike uh, the Predator character from the feature films, it turns out that they were the ones that were being brutalized by the people who looked like us. Um, that, that Chakotay was with, it was completely turned around. Yes, they were hideous, they were ugly, they were, they were you know, horrible looking, but in fact they were the ones who were being victimized by the others. And, and there was that whole social, they, they just turned the whole thing upside down, just completely flipped it around. And I thought that was really a fascinating uh, episode, a fascinating story. Um, and, and I know it doesn't have necessarily anything to do with the technology, but it, it, is, it does have to do with, you know, the, I, what I think is right about the storytelling is taking these stories um, that, that have to deal with people and how we interact with each other and how we perceive each other and turning them upside down, you know, and looking at them from a whole different direction, a whole different perspective. Uh, and I think that's one of the, was one of my favorite episodes that we did. Making very good points, and, and we did try to you know find those stories. We we're always trying to find the you know the heart of the story. What's the story about the theme? And you know they don't work if they're just about the technology or some scientific puzzle that you're solving. One of my favorites from Voyager was called Latent Image, which was a terrific episode. Uh, Bob Picardo played our holographic doctor, and he was uh, essentially a program that was sentient, developing personality, developing. Um, Interests in, in the arts, and um, and, and a unique, uh, you know, unique sentient being. It, it was evolving from this very complex program. He was faced with a dilemma uh, when a couple of crew members were were both critically injured, and he only had the resources to save one. And how do you choose? Well, he chose Harry Kim, one of our regulars, 
And I was like, <laughs> on that level, it was kind of obvious. Things. But what was interesting about the story is that he started having these um, he started having these weird blackouts. He, his program would seem to black out for a few minutes at a time. He said, "What's going on? It's strange." Well. He goes to the engineer, she says, oh, I think, you know, I don't know, it's some little glitch in your program, let me check it out. Oh, here it is, I'll fix it. You should be fine now. But it kept happening, and he started to get paranoid. He thought there was an alien entity or something on the ship that was, you know, trying to take over it. And so he set up a little camera in the sick bay, because he didn't think that this was happening randomly. He thought, somebody is coming in and turning me off for some nefarious purpose. He sets up this camera, and he has one of these blackout episodes. He remembers the camera, he goes back, he says, Captain Janeway. She's coming in and turning off my probe. What the hell? What's, what's going on here? He confronts her. He thinks she's an alien. Well, what we find out is that his program was not equipped to deal with this Sophie's Choice conflict. I have to choose whose life to save. I have to make that choice. And it was driving him slowly insane. And they would turn him off periodically to try to erase the memory of him doing that. But the program had become so complex that they could never quite do it. There was always something that, you know, something in the back of his head, so to speak, that would make him go and figure this out again. And Captain Janeway said, look, we've tried every which way to fix this. The only way we can really fix it is to reset him. Erase everything he has learned, everything he has become over the past five years. Just reset him to the nascent stage of his program from the beginning. And it's like, you're just, you're just gonna wipe his memory. Wipe out who he is. Five whole seasons? Five whole seasons. <laughs> so, um... Does he still get the residual checks? No. <laughs> um, so anyway, Seven of Nine, our board character, was the one who went to Janeway and said, you can't do this. You know, you've given me a lot of Latin, you know, you've done all of this stuff for me, and I've been a pain in the ass to try to embrace my humanity and to recover who I was and who I could be. You cannot, you know, do this to him. We have to find another way. And the other way was to just let him sit and talk through his grief and, and basically, you know, hours upon hours of kind of psychotherapy to let him finally resolve this guilt that he was feeling over making that terrible choice. And it was a really lovely episode, and one of the things that was great about it, I thought, from a storytelling standpoint, is it's one of these episodes that starts <laughs> off and you think it's about one thing, and then halfway through it flips and, oh, suddenly it's about something else, something far more interesting. You think that some alien is hacking the doctor's program, no. It's about guilt and conscience, and how does one grapple with that, and and what 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 lengths can one go, should we go to, you know, toward this sentient program to fix it as opposed to letting him evolve as a human. So I just thought that was terrific. Sorry. What season was that in? I believe season five. It's called Latent Image. Yeah. I think that there's a definite theme emerging, which is science in the service of story, which I think is how it should be, yeah. particularly when you come to science fiction. Right. I mean, you use these things to build a world, to build characters, mm -hmm. to drive some of your plots, but it always has to be a good story, and uh, we've been hearing a little bit about that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to touch upon is the famous quote, you know, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Right. There are many things on Star Trek that were visionary in a whole different way. Um, that in fact inspired people to become scientists and invent those things. Yes. I'm thinking specifically of the inventor of the cell phone, but there are theoretical physicists studying warp drive. Perhaps you guys can comment on what it was like to be a part of a series that has that back and forth, that inspires, that draws on science for its ideas, and then feeds back into science. Well, yeah, the, 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 the one thing I was always uh, wondering about was uh, on our show, we, we were, here we are in the middle of the Delta Quadrant, we're all by ourselves, we're nowhere near home, and uh, uh, here we are on the ship, and, and I was <laughs> I think about, for example, the internet, which is something that connects us, you know, as human beings to the entire planet instantaneously, and people become obsessed with spending a lot of time on this, on, on the computers and, and, and dealing with this with relationships and things with people they've never met before, never seen before, may never see. And and we have on the ship a holodeck. And I always wondered how we ever got anything done <laughs> on there with the contraption like that. Yeah. Can, can you imagine? I mean, nobody would want to go to their stations or their posts for any time. They'd all be thinking about us when I get back on a holodeck, you know, and use it for whatever. Uh, we can all imagine. Uh, I have a holodeck and a yeah. replicator. I'd never leave that. Oh, yeah, we never leave the house. I mean, I think that's an alien probes are going to come up again. <laughs> <laughs> we 
we had a name of Probe Room. We, you know, we were the prequel. <laughs> I can't imagine, you know, again, a little sort of comparing the holodeck to the technology we have now, which is the internet. I mean, this new technology, how do human beings handle or deal with this stuff, kind of stuff on a daily basis? And where are we going from here forward? You know, how, more, how much more sophisticated? Eventually, we will have hologram technology that we will be using. We'll be watching movies and television in, in three-dimensional uh, holograms. Um, it's going to leave the flat 2D screen. It's going to be three-dimensional eventually. And then you'll be able to manipulate those even more so. So all that is coming. And I think that's uh, it's just interesting. We, we as human beings have this, uh, I mean, we do have somewhat of an addictive personality trait somewhere in our DNA and, and, uh, and, and obsessive trait to some degree. And I, I'm just wondering how disruptive that's going to be down the line as if the Internet isn't as already disruptive as it is. That's certainly what, uh, and again, I, I'll keep coming back to the what's right, wrong, and visionary from the Trek universe. Uh, to me, the thing that is right is what you're pointing to, which is what a wonderful way for fiction to uh, prompt all of us, not just scientists, to consider the role of technology in our future, to consider the actual technological innovations themselves. Hey, wouldn't it be great to have A? What I sometimes thought was wrong was that we didn't always do as good a job doing just what Tim talked about. I'd have loved to have seen an episode in which nobody would get out of the holiday. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a great idea. You know, or the idea, which we touched on a little bit in Enterprise, I would have liked to have seen us go farther with it, that nobody wants to get in the goddamn, you know, like, I don't want my atoms scattered to the full <laughs> Are you nuts? Um, and I think that's one of the things that Star Trek, when it's most successful, does. It sort of argues that when we look at a technological innovation, we have to consider all the repercussions of that innovation. How will it change a society? How will it change the way we relate to each other? I mean, look at the Industrial Revolution. Good God have mercy. It is unimaginable where we would be if we did go back in time 250 years. Every single technological innovation has had so much repercussion. And I think that's when Star Trek, for me, works the best. It's when we actually say, huh, what would it really be like? And for me, when we run into trouble with Star Trek, it's because we sometimes start from this base of we've managed to perfect ourselves. And we start from the assumption that all technology is good, or that all technology will ultimately be handled uh, beneficently. And I think that's sometimes a trap. Um, yeah, I agree with that. And there, there were, you know, certainly in the original series, you know, there were always uh, computers run amok kind of episodes. Yeah. And, you know, well, well, we're going to let a computer be in command of the ship. Captain Kirk is now redundant. And that, of course, proved to be a bad idea. So I guess those things were touched on. I think that, yeah, they could have, I, I would have loved to see that, you know, the guy wouldn't come out of the holodeck. We did do a couple of, yeah. <laughs> I would have loved that. Harry, come out of the Harry Kim had sort of a crush on a holographic character, which was kind of an interesting thing, you know. So we, we touched on, uh, you know, we touched on that a little bit. I, I just want to speak briefly to, you know, it occurred to me, yes, the bad. There were, yeah, there were examples of the bad and the, the Voyager pilot, and I, I tried to dissuade them from using this. There was this group, the Kazon, uh, that was going to be our sort of nemesis for the first couple of seasons of the show. And when Voyager is flung 70,000 light years across the galaxy, we're, we're in, we find ourselves on a planet that uh, is basically desiccated. They don't have water. The, and the Kazon, or, or I don't know, there was something about trying to, they came to steal our water. And these, these, this was a warp capable civilization. Now, water is not only one of the easiest things to find in the universe, it's one of the easiest things to make. It's hydrogen and oxygen. Space is full of hydrogen and oxygen. Every star is surrounded by a cloud of comets that are mostly made of water. You know, the idea that people who could travel among the stars would ever need to worry about water is absolutely ridiculous. And I, you know, I told, in more polite terms than that, the executive producers of Voyager, that, you know, could we find something other than the water? But their attitude was in. Water's relatable, it's easy to understand people. It's like, you know, our audience, I think, is a little more sophisticated than that. You were looking for, like, gin or scotch or something? At least. Yeah. So, you know, there were times when we, when we would fall back on those kinds of, you know, rather simplistic um, crutches. Um, and I got, you know, the other good thing about the job is I did get interesting letters from people who were generally very complimentary and helped me in my job as the science consultant. 
Uh, that job forced me to stretch my imagination quite a bit because when I would read a script or a story, I, my, my first impulse was to think about, well, what do we know today and what's real physics today and how would that apply to this? And many times, well, it just didn't work. But I didn't want to just say, well, it can't work. You got to give them an alternative. So I had to stretch my imagination and extrapolate and think, well, that could work by analogy to this. Oh, hey, maybe that, uh, who knows, maybe someday, you know? So that was, a, that was a fun exercise for me. And I think that, again, the technical, minded people who watch the show, most of them also approached it from that from that direction. They look at it typically, oh no, you can't do that. Well, I don't know, maybe someday. But no, well, maybe. I'd like to open up the uh, into questions with the audience. I'm sure a lot of you might have like favorite moments or favorite questions you're dying to ask. So questions, anyone? Yes, in back. Um, yes, read Okay. Um, first I wanted to thank John for apparently recording all the stuff that's been in my brain for the last couple of weeks, because what you said about the good and the bad has absolutely mirrored what I've been thinking. Uh, my question You're is... You're stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I teach science, I teach physics and astronomy at a high school level, and a, you know, a lot of the inspirational effect that people have mentioned is very real. Um, and I've certainly had some of the frustrations, I think, similar to what Andre was just talking about. Uh, and my question is actually to Andre is, other than the example you just mentioned with the Kazon and the water, what is the biggest, I guess, you know, sort of fight you had with, you know, the powers that be over the science that you lost? Oh, that I lost. The water thing is the one thing that just sort of sticks in my mind at the moment. Um, you know, they were very, once I, once I showed them that I could do the job and they got to know me and, you know, they were really very um, receptive, and I, I, I knew enough to, to, to know that I had to go in with alternatives if I said, if I said you know, you really just can't do this. Um, yeah, the water thing, uh, obviously lost that one. Um, I'm trying to remember there were, if there were other specifics, you know, sometimes, one of the good things about working on the show is that before they really got very far, they would often call me and ask me questions, which was nice. There was an episode of Deep Space Nine that was written by, uh, uh, David Weddle and Bradley Thompson, two great guys, great writers, who went on to write for Battlestar Galactica, and I think are now writing for CSI. Um, they were doing a show that involved a superstition about the Bajorans and a comet that was coming into the solar system where uh, Bajor was located. And they called and said, you know, we kind of know what a comet is, but how big is a comet? What are they made out of? And how, how fast do they go? And, you know, it's like, we sent a ship out there, what are we going to see? And so, hey, it's said, great. Gave them a little comet primer over the phone, and then I wrote up some notes about comets and gave them more details, and they worked that stuff into the script. So generally, you know, it worked very smoothly. There was something that I vetoed. One of the few times I can remember sort of just putting my foot down on something, and they were just like, yeah, you're right, that's silly. There was, uh, it was actually an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, which I worked on in the seventh season. And uh, there was going to be a little B story, you know, the little subplot that involved uh, Captain Picard, taking some sort of a high-tech kayak on a lava flow all the way to the core of a Class M planet. Uh, because this was some sort of recreation. And I said that... But I know that's stupid! Yeah! I like So, uh, you know, I read this, and this was just in a story, you know, a treatment. It was not part of a script yet, so there's still time to save them. Um, I said, you know, Think about it, you know, an Earth-like planet's going to be seven, 8,000 miles in diameter. So you're really going to have the time to travel at least 4,000 miles in the core of a planet on a, in a kayak. Um, and, you know, lava flows, well, you know, the pressures change. It's just not going to, you know, it's, and it's, it's just so Jules Verne. Do you really want to go that retro journey to the center of the Earth? And I don't remember if I suggested some alternative, but they, they, they dropped it. And I think that they probably knew that they were going to drop it. Or that was I don't know if it was a filler or something, but but generally speaking, I mean, the only thing that they would they would catch up on is, and I, and I learned this very quickly. Well, not very quickly. Certainly in the first season that I was working on the show, I would tend to be too wordy, and you can understand why, given how much given how much I tend to babble when I when I talk, but. I, uh, I got a good lesson in this from uh, uh, Terry Farrell, who played Dax on Deep Space Nine. A tall, beautiful woman. First season I worked on Deep Space Nine, I got invited to the rap party, which was very exciting. I think 
think I'd only been to one other rap party. And um, I, I go, uh, you know, it's at, a, it's at a restaurant bar kind of a place and mingling with the crowd and, and I see Terry Farrell and she was standing off by herself and I'd never met her and I thought I'd introduce myself. And she's very tall, she's like six feet tall and, and really lovely and I, I walked up to her very shyly and said, hi, Miss Farrell, hi, I'm Andre Bormanis. I'm, oh, hi, how are you, nice to meet you. And uh, I said, you know, I, I have to apologize. I'm the guy who puts all of that techno babble in your dialogue. She gets this look on her face. She grabs me by the lapels of the coat, literally pulls me off my feet, says, you fucking asshole! <laughs> and, then she, and then she laughed, and she sat me down. I said, I'm just kidding. <laughs> she, said, she said, the thing is, when I'm doing a scene where I'm just talking to the computer, when I'm by myself, I'm just asking the computer to do this or that. I don't mind it at all. Put as much techno babble into my dialogue as you like. But she said, when well, I'm in a scene with other actors, and I'm thinking about my character and my lines and interacting with the, you know, with the other characters in the scene, that's when it gets tough for me because I'm trying to remember all of my little actorly things, trying to be in the scene with these other characters, and I'm trying to remember these words that mean absolutely nothing to me. And that was a very good lesson. And I got that lesson also in another script earlier on where I'd, uh, I kept coming up with this term. There was a field on a planet that was keeping our equipment from working and I wanted to do something sort of physical legit. So I said, oh, you know, a rapidly fluctuating electromagnetic field, oh, you know, geomagnetic, yeah. blah, blah, blah. that would do it. And Palomini, who was, you know, the guy who had to sort of talk about this in the script, had to say this like five times. And I'd wrote, write my notes and I'd get them back and Michael Piller, who was the executive producer, I saw Next to my techno babble, he wrote NGE. I didn't know what NGE meant. And um, I called Jerry Taylor, who was another executive producer, and I said, hey, Jerry, you know, um, Michael's written this NGE. Do you know what that means, George? Not good enough. <laughs> so I was mortified. And I realized, you know, shit, he, Colin has to say this. All he knows, why am I doing, you know, I said, how about duonetic field? Which is just a term I made up. But they had uh, duotronic circuits on the original Enterprise, so I thought, ooh, duonetic field, you know, it's kind of a reference to the original show, it's very nerdy. This actually raises a really good question uh, for the two actors here. What is life? <laughs> you fucking asshole! <laughs> Characters. I mean, I heard stories last night about Dr. Flox and his incredibly long tongue, and you know, you remember that. that. But you have to say these lines, and you have like these uh, probably prosthetics, I assume, since you no. seem to have a normal size, but, um, you know, that you have to work with, and you have to act through all of this. So, what is it like for the two of you to have to do this? Uh, well, I, you know, my character, fortunately, I was not a science officer on my ship. Uh, I was, you know, crossing my fingers and very happy not to have that going on. I, I didn't have too much of the techno babble to go through. It did, on occasion, um, it did kind of on occasion annoy me to, to, because like what Terry was saying, I had the same sort of feeling sometimes when I had scenes with people and, it, and, it, and they, there might be a speech or two that was pretty heavily laden with that stuff. And I kept thinking to myself, man, do we need all this? Do we need as much of this? And if I can harken back to the original series, there was not as much in the original series. There was very little <laughs> techno babble in the original series. And those shows were actually longer than ours were. Um, and yet we still told the story. So I kept thinking, why can't we just, you know. Yeah, I guess, yeah. it was just, the stuff was very, it was very simple. They didn't, they didn't really harp on the, the dialogue and the language. And I know that because we live in a, in a, in a technological age, I think if the writers and the producers assume that that's what people want to hear, they want to hear it be more sophisticated, more technical. And I think that, I think you lose, I think you start to glaze over if you hear too much of that. I think you have to have uh, a, a, a really happy medium or balance between that and not, not really harp on it so much. More harp on what the difficulty and, and is it where the conflict or whatever has to be resolved, the character interaction and the emotion of the scenes and the moments uh, of the dilemma, uh, focusing on that much more. I was very lucky not to have too much of that stuff going on, as far as you know, mine. Uh, there were a couple of buttons on my console that didn't work so well, though. I was very, I had problems with that. <laughs> the button that where they didn't work with is like they're supposed to work all the time. I couldn't, you know, find things that I was looking for. <clears throat> I did have a rubber head and I hate it. <laughs> but on the other hand, I'm a character guy, so I wasn't having to show up five days a week. That was, for the most part, the, uh, you know, the handsome guys and the pretty girls were the ones who wooed ale and babes and got into fistfights. 
So my role was uh, pretty much to show up and kind of spout some of this techno babble and gobbledygook. Um, but when you're not working every day, you have enough time to memorize it. That's really the problem if you're an actor. When you get a script, as you frequently do in television, the night before you start shooting, because once you get into the into the chug a chug a chug of it, you know it's it's pushing a boulder uphill to keep these scripts coming out. So sometimes the night before, when you're shooting a scene the next day, and it's words that either, as you say, what did you say, duenetic? Yeah. Yeah. You look in the dictionary. It's like there's no word duenetic. <laughs> duenetic. What is duenetic? <laughs> you know, you have nothing to attach to. So all you're doing is memorizing sound. I felt particularly badly for, in our show, Hoshi, the gal who played the linguistics officer, because her entire script sometimes would consist of <laughs> And she'd have to memorize this. Over, you know, I'm 50 years old. I can't do that shit. I don't know. Being a young girl. But she'd have pages of it, and they were very persnickety about it. You, of course, I know, had nothing to do with this. But we would get a page in which the accents would be there. It's not unagala, it's unagala. <laughs> and if you fuck that up, you gotta do it again. <laughs> and this sometimes, I think, was a bit of a problem, just as an actor, I would say, is that this led to a certain kind of uh, anal quality. <laughs> We would frequently be called in to ADR, Additional Dialogue Record, i.e. after the episode had been shot, we would have to go into a sound studio and re-record the dialogue because perhaps the pronunciation wasn't just so. I remember in the first season I had a, a long speech and I thought, if I do say so myself, I did a good job. But the word Neanderthal, I pronounced Neanderthal, but apparently it should be pronounced Neanderthal. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah so I, like, oh, come on, <laughs> I'm from Denobula. <laughs> but when you're additional dialogue recording, it invariably sounds tinny, you know, and if you're uh, a television veteran, you have, you know that, you know, yes. we have an ear. When you hear additional dialogue recording on a TV show, the actor goes, Ugh, clunk, because it doesn't quite match, it can't quite match the original quality. I thought there was a little bit too much attachment to having it all be clean, pristine, and perfect, which I think was one of the problems as Star Trek evolved, is it didn't change its visual signature and it didn't quite change some of that kind of a signature. I'd have loved to have overlapping dialogue and people cutting each other off, Absolutely. human speak, Absolutely. human behavior. Absolutely. He's met, as a matter of fact, on a, on a filming technical level, yes, uh, every single corridor scene that we did. <laughs> Every single corridor scene that we were walking in, I had to ADR. Every, thing. over seven years. And I, and, I would, and I knew that when we shot it, I'm not gonna be saying this dialogue, it's, this dialogue's not gonna last. I'm gonna have to go back in and say it again. So after a while, I started you know, doing the scene with that knowledge in mind already, that I'm gonna come back in and re-record it, because we're walking. And I'd walk, I'd go into the room and I'd say, why? Why are we doing this? Why? Are we, there's nothing. I can't hear any noise. There's nothing there. Oh, it's the footprints on the carpet. They're, they can hear the what? And, and as an actor, you know, the thing is, when you're when you're performing in the moment, you're allowing yourself to respond somewhat improvisationally. So yes. what comes out of you is coming from a very organic, honest, unanticipated place. When you go back into a recording studio and you match that, you are now being told not to perform it organically, but to do what you did months ago or weeks ago. And in essence, you are not anymore acting it. You are trying to mechanically match something which comes from an entirely different place. Yes. Here, not here. So there's always a deterioration, I think, of performance. That was one of my big gripes. You fucking asshole! No, I think he's, he's <laughs> right. No, it was sensing the, it was a lot of hostility. <laughs> yeah. It was the producers. Uh, you're literally, you know, you've got a series of beeps that go on while you're watching yourself on the screen, and you have to match exactly. The, 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 you have to sync your mouth with the words, and that's the process. There's nothing emotional about it at all. You just have to, you have to try to match what you did, the, the inflections that you did at the time and also the timing. No matter how good your performance is gonna be and how you feel it, if it doesn't sync, they're not gonna keep it. You have to do it again. And it is a mechanical process. We had to do it on every single corridor. You know how many corridor sequences that is? And it's a whole bunch of corridor walking and talking. And I mean some long speeches, which you would actually do in pieces. You never do the whole speech. It was always a sentence period, a sentence period. I was like, oh man, drove me crazy. And that, you know, 
And I agree, I agree with uh, John about that. We, we could have, you know, made it a little bit more of a natural sort of feeling and flowing thing. Yeah. Yeah, we have a gentleman way back there. I have a question. In the, in the manufacturing process, if you have engineers doing drawings and sending them down to the shop floor, and this is the way you will do it, it doesn't always work out well. I found that when you got the people on the floor building the product, to sit down with engineering, and they, they, they see the drawings and, and they go through that and they get input from the people who are building, or in your case, the actors. Is there ever a chance for the actors to sit down with the writers and say, this isn't going to work, we think, because of this and make a smoother process? Sometimes, and, and you know, it varies from show to show. I, I never thought, uh, personally, that the folks who ran our show were opposed to our calling and saying, hey, I've got an issue or a question, I'm not sure what the motivation is, why would the character do this, this doesn't seem in keeping with what you've established heretofore. But the problem is, is that an uh, analogous, perhaps to your situation, is tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. You have to get the product out by a deadline. So it's always a challenge for actors to pick and choose their battles. And we all know, I think, in this business, actors who pick the wrong battles at the wrong time. They hold up the day, and suddenly the big battle that might have been justified don't have time for it, you know? So you get to be pretty, I think, if you're astute and you've been in the business long enough, you get to be pretty careful about what instances you choose to actually do what you're talking about. Raise your hand <laughs> and say, uh, you really? Yeah, I think, yeah, the, go ahead. Oh, okay, yeah, the, the blonde woman right back there. Uh, yeah, Tim, what's ADR? You said you're walking down the corridor and ADR. What is that? It's, all, it's, it's automated dialogue. Oh. Additional dialogue. Additional dialogue, Additional dialogue. recording. recording. It's, it's um, just going into a room and watching yourself on a big screen, and they give you a series of beeps, and you have to stand there and say your lines and sync everything to your lips. It, it's when the original dialogue, when it was recorded live, doesn't sound good to the producers for a variety of reasons. If the dialogue overlaps, there's a squeaky wheel there's on the camera door, dolly door track. opening and closing. Yeah. Yeah. All, every time you hear those doors going like, the shh, yeah. those doors. <laughs> yeah. And we, some, all that was recorded. Some over. shows I don't mind if it's not a pristine soundtrack. Sometimes, sometimes the, the aesthetic of the show allows it to be a little noisy. You hear the birds, you hear the rustle of the you know, wind, you hear the water, blah, 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 blah. You, it's muddy. And some shows are much more persnickety about it. So it varies wildly in our business from show to show. This gentleman right here, and then I'll move back over here. Thank you. Um, I say, I'm interested in this question of, you know, here's our society now, right? Here's the Trek universe, which we all admire. How do we get from that point to you know, where we are now to, to the Trek universe? And it seems to me that there's not a lot of science fiction that shows that transition from the present day to a kind of utopian future, future anyway. It, more in the dystopic universe. Than yeah, we, yeah, we're good at showing yeah. the dystopian sort yeah, of trend. Right. What would it take for the Trek franchise to, to, to give us that slice? I mean, is it even within the realm of possibility that I, we you know, see Trek deal with that transition? I'll, I'll tell you something interesting. When uh, Brandon Brog and Rick Berman were developing Enterprise, Brandon told me, and he fought for this and was, was shot down. I don't know if you guys know this. He wanted the first season of Enterprise to take place on Earth and be about the construction of the Star Trip, Starship Enterprise, the NX-01, mm -hmm. and the controversy <coughs> about should we build this starship? Should we be going out that far? You know, we've, we've just sort of put our toes in the water. You know, the premise of the show was that we'd been to a few nearby star systems. We were capable of traveling, you know, warp one or warp two or something. Well, now we've got this new engine. It can take us warp five. We'll go a hundred times farther. Whoa, 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 whoa. There was a lot of xenophobia in the society. And we were going to have like an active element of people who wanted to try to prevent Enterprise from being built and who like in a climactic uh, episode later in the season would blow the damn thing up or try to blow it up. And, you know, but Paramount said no. Star Trek is about spaceships. You got to be out in space. Brandon did not want a transporter on Enterprise. He said maybe in season two or three we'll, we'll build the transporter. It'll be this experimental technology that Archer will reluctantly allow to be installed on his ship when they come back to space dock. And Paramount said no. Star Trek, you got to have a transporter. Uh, Paramount is the studio that owns the franchise that tells you what you can and cannot do when you develop the show. 
And, you know, some of the great ideas that I thought Brandon and Rick had for how we could do this show in a different way, in a fresh way, and, you know, more conflict with, among the characters and so forth, well, the people who give you the money have, a, have, a, have a, obviously a lot of say in, in what you can and cannot do. The name names, or? Uh, I, I, you know, I, I guess I would if I could. I don't remember at the time. You know, I'm sure they're all gone now, whoever the executives of Paramount were. Carrie McCluggage. Made. Carrie McCluggage was probably one of them, yeah. Is this being filmed? Oh, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> it never works in Paramount again. Paramount again. Yeah, I'm going to leave one studio left. <laughs> I wanted to add on that. Oh. There, there was a line in the pilot of Enterprise, and the captain said, and I'm paraphrasing, we've conquered hunger, disease, war, blah, 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 we're ready to go out, and, and yada, yada, yada. I, I always had two thoughts. One is that there is an inherent um, falsity to the Fantasia of Star Trek, the idea that the human animal will ever be anything other than the human animal. We will always be greedy. We will always be covetous. We will always throw sharp elbows around. So, to a certain extent, it's an unanswerable question. Uh, my interest was always, well, what if, you, what if you try and answer that question? I mean, you know, certainly you could argue in certain respects mankind has advanced. We no longer, at least in much of the world, keep slaves. Women are allowed to vote, for the most part. I think that's a good idea. Um, that was just a little political joke. <laughs> if my wife was in the audience, she would have said something. That's why I'm used to her being here. Um, so I think there is a valid justification for trying to answer the question of, well, how do we ever get to the point where disease has been banished? It involves a sharing of resources, it involves radically rethinking the way in which we cooperate as society, and the way in which we share our wealth. We would never in the real world be able to come up with a perfect solution that, you know, eradicates disease. But at least we could acknowledge that those are the kinds of sociological questions that need to get addressed. And I don't know that Star Trek is ever going to answer it because it may fly in the face of what Mr. Roddenberry was about, you know, which is assume we've arrived and go from there. Okay, yes. you and then the woman in the orange. I was just wondering if you'd uh, worked with J.J. Abrams on the Star Trek reboot, uh, you two. Uh, I did not, no, I, I knew. I, not only did I know nothing about it, I didn't want to know anything about it because for the first time in almost 20 years, I was going to get to see a Star Trek movie or show that I had not read and didn't know what was going to happen. I so, was banned from the lot. <laughs> <laughs> I was not asked, you know. I mean, it was their own thing. Nobody from the original, uh, from the previous shows, as far as I know, was involved in it, other than me. No, I, I think all of us were, you know, not even, the people were not allowed to go anywhere near that place. <laughs> it was such a, a tight lid on it. Paramount wanted a new broom sweeping clean. Yeah, yeah that's pretty much it. And, and, and like John said earlier, we, you know, uh, and, and Andre said earlier that we don't have any control over, you know, uh, if you want to make a story, a sci-fi story of any kind, and do exactly what you want to do, you have to write it yourself and make it yourself. Um, and that's it. There's, there's, you know, you're, you're beholden to the uh, powers that be for a lot of other things. And some of them may not make any sense whatsoever uh, in many cases. So there you go. Sort of a follow-up to uh, the question about whether you were, had any input into things you thought weren't right for your character. Andre was a um, you know, science consultant. Tim, I know from your talk yesterday, you're very knowledgeable astronomy. John's obviously well-read. Were there ever any times that either of you ran up against any science and you went, whoa, 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 this is too stupid to say? And if so, did you ever <laughs> win any of those? Or did you not even try? It wasn't science so much as it was behavior, you yes. know, which is ultimately what actors are primarily yeah. concerned with. You trust the fact, but the folks who know more than you do are grappling with the science. Uh, what you would sometimes say is, you know, what you've established is a character who is likely to do this under this situation, who by dint of his history, his culture, is not, um, for instance, for me, I found out at one point that Dr. Phlox was uncomfortable with touching people, which to me sort of came out of the blue sky, the idea that he was in the Denobulan infantry. I thought, the infantry? Really? <laughs> Denobula has an infantry? That just seemed kind of crazy to me. <laughs> Those kinds of things that seem sort of culturally askew, uh -huh. or anthropologically askew, were things that you might raise a hand to. Tim, any of the science ever bugged you? Not for myself, you know, uh, my character, I mean, I've had the ability to meld with other people's uh, minds, and uh, much against the doctor's wishes most of the time, uh, which made perfect sense to me uh, as a person, um, they, my character would still do it. 
And I did argue with Michael Piller at the very beginning about uh, the show we did called Meld, where I, 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 was, I did a mind meld with this character who was very, very violent, um, um, and, and to find out why. And uh, after going through the whole two-part, I think it was a two-part episode, uh, of that chaos and craziness where I lose control of my own emotions, etc. I never, we never answered the question of why this guy did what he did. Why did he commit murder? Why did he do this horrible act? We never answered the question. And I, and I went to Michael and said, Michael, why, did, how come we don't have a solution for what happened? Why is the guy doing what, he, what he's doing? And, and, and personally, myself, I always, I'm fascinated by the human condition. I'm fascinated by this, this, the human psyche. Why do we do? Why are we as violent? Why do we do the things we do as human beings in our society? Um, obviously not everybody, but, but certain... Uh, you know who you are. Stuff. Yes, you know who you are. Why do you have these serial killer thoughts in your head? Why? Where does it come from? And what's, the, what's, the <laughs> what's the purpose? What's the purpose? What's the reason? Because I know that there's got to be some kind of reason. Really physiological or is it environmental? Does something happen to him? Is he, is it, is, you know, whatever. It would have been just so cool to find out what the answer was after all of the stuff we've gone through, and he said, uh, "Does it? It's not important." He didn't. I didn't want to. He didn't want to dwell on it. Didn't want to bother with it. And I thought, "Oh man, that's that was a big letdown for me as a as an actor because my character is able to do this from a technological standpoint, if you will, a an organic technological standpoint. I can go into someone else's mind and re and and, and meld with their consciousness, and that's an intense stuff. So uh, why couldn't we find out?" What the secret was? What I would—I was in there. Why couldn't I identify? It? And I didn't want to do it. So. Yeah. We've got time for one more question from this side of the room, right there. Next. Um, you, you were mentioning a lot of stuff that you um, wish Star Trek the series had done, and I was thinking about the newest movie. And I mean, granted, yesterday I heard a lot of talk about saying how the science wasn't that good, but I, I feel like the movie did address some of the issues of well, there was conflict between mm -hmm. members of the ship. You did actually see sort of the construction mm -hmm. of the Enterprise mm -hmm. and uh, just how it came together. I was wondering, since this panel is a little more diverse than just like sci science driven, um, what, what, do you, what would you think uh, as a whole? Do you think it was an improvement of story? And what was the, what did you need to give up science wise? Mm -hmm. what, do you think the compromise was worth it? Something like that? I, you know, I liked the movie quite a bit. I, I thought the characters were, were fun and interesting. I liked the actors. Zachary Kinto was great as Spock. There were a lot of things I didn't like about the movie that are sort of the nitpicky things, like, you know, Red Mat or what the hell is that. The fact that they wiped out Vulcan and killed six billion Vulcans, I thought was a little unsafe. But he only yeah. cries when he insults his mother. That's right. Yeah, that's you know, you know. <laughs> and, you know, Those six billion people are hamburgers? <laughs> They, they randomly eject Kirk, you know, from the ship, and he ends up not only on the planet where Spock and Scotty are, but within, like, walking distance of those two guys. There were just a lot of little things like that that I thought were sloppy storytelling, you know, that could have been better. Um, but, you know, overall, I thought it was, uh, you know, it was fairly refreshing. I'm glad it was successful. I hope they continue. I hope the next movie is, is better. I, I guess, you know, my biggest complaint about the movie, too, is it didn't really feel to me, to me and maybe I missed it, but... What was it really about, other than the crew coming together? You know, if you look at a movie like Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, you know, that, you know, that movie's about something more than just the battle. It's about Kirk kind of dealing with his mortality and his getting older. And, you know, I mean, I just don't know what that movie was really about in a big thematic sort of way, which I thought was, you know. I think there's also, there's a, there's a disconnect between the movies and the TV show in that a TV show, you know, it's episodic by nature and it's a small screen, so you can have stories that are small, stories. You can have stories about the relationships between the crew. On the big screen, inevitably, it's going to come down to special effects laden budget, and it's going to be about phaser, you know, phase pistol battles and explosions and etc. Uh, those to me are the stories that I'm the least interested in as a Star Trek fan. I tend, as soon as it's a third act, uh, you know, like boom, 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 it's like, you know, uh, so I, I enjoyed the first third, maybe the first half of the movie, and then kind of got a little bit snoozy at the end. And I agree, in a way that the idea that you have to uh, go into an alternate timeline to give yourself permission to, frankly, kill off the actors down the road if they start asking for more money. <laughs> <laughs> Am I a cynic? Yeah. <laughs> a little. Um, I thought that was a cop-out, but you know, I understand their motivations. 
In the parallel universe, Spock can die, Zachary Quinto. How much do you want? <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, as, as far as the, the I, I, I was like Andre, I didn't want to know anything about the Star Trek feature before I went to go see it. I didn't want to know, and in general, I don't want to know about the stories before I go to see them. I don't want to have any preconceptions or anything else. I just want to see what's happening, let it unfold. And um, the, the only thing, I, I can say one thing I, about it, I thought it was good because it was posit it was it was a, a re- telling the story, and, it, and they shot it differently. It looks different than our series did. They went away from all the structure and all the norms and everything else, and I think that was a very good thing. It's a big plus. And I think that they attempted to draw in, obviously, new viewers and people to, um, to Star Trek, uh, in term, the Star Trek world and the franchise, um, to open it up to other people other than those who are, of us who already know all about the backstory and such. So I thought that was a very good, uh, a very good idea. And it's obviously in keeping with the theme of the day, in terms of the studios, remaking absolutely everything from the beginning. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, they're not—they're not certainly not moving from that path at all. But yeah, I thought—I thought they did a pretty good job. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists for being here. This is a great discussion. You guys are awesome. Thank you.